Good afternoon and welcome to our cardiac and vascular lecture series. I am Dr. Galvin Hakim, Assistant Vice President of International Healthcare Partnerships and Insurance Development at Baptist Health International. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this informative presentation this afternoon. I would like to extend warm greetings to our friends across Latin America and the Caribbean and everyone joining us today. During this interactive presentation, you will have the ability to ask questions via the Q&A feature located in the bottom of your screen. I will be your moderator in today's lecture. This afternoon, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Charles Ma, who will be presenting the lecture titled Evolution of Physiological Mitral Valve Repair. Dr. Ma is a cardiothoracic surgeon at Baptist Health Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute and specializes in cardiac surgery. He received his medical training in the University of Miami School of uh, Miller School of Medicine. Dr. Ma completed his general surgery residency in the University of Minnesota, followed by a cardiothoracic surgery fellowship at New York uh, University, where he served as a clinical instructor in the development of cardiothoracic surgery at NYU Grossman School of Medicine. His research has been published widely in journals of surgical research, the British Journal of Dermatology, and he is also a member of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons. Dr. Ma, Dr. Ma's approach to care is to treat every patient like family. He emphasizes joint decisions making, creating the best treatment plan based on uh, the patient's and values and wishes. Please let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Charles Ma. Dr. Ma, what a pleasure having you with us this afternoon. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. The floor is yours. Thank you for the kind introduction, Dr. Hakim. So uh, welcome everyone and thank you for joining me. It's a great uh, pleasure to be able to talk to you about uh, mitral valve repair, which is really a, a big passion of mine in, in cardiac surgery. Uh, let me share with you my slides here. So today we're gonna to talk about um, the, the history and, and evolution of techniques over the last three or four decades uh, at NYU, uh, which is where I received my uh, training in cardiothoracic surgery. The disclosures, these are the slides of my uh, uh, chairman and mentor, Dr. Aubrey Galloway. I, I thought this really uh, gives us a good understanding of how we got to where we are today uh, and it gives us insight on, on where this field's headed uh, in the future. So the theme of this talk is really innovation, and, and you'll see uh, this theme come up repeatedly throughout this, this lecture or talk. So NYU, uh, where I trained, was, was a center of uh, innovation and, and pioneering bunch of valve repair. Uh, my, our, uh, our former chairman before Dr. Galloway Dr. Steve Colvin uh, was the first in 1978 to perform the uh, Carpentier type mitral valve repair in the US. Uh, that led to uh, an experience uh, that followed with publications. And, and today, we, NYU's performed over 4,000 uh, mitral valve repairs over the last four years. And it also really started with um, Alan Carpentier, who, who was a French surgeon in Paris. Uh, who began performing mitral valve reconstruction for mitral valve, degenerative mitral valve regurgitation uh, in the 70s. Um, he, you know, he really is considered the godfather of mitral valve repair in, in today. And in, in uh, 1983, Dr. Frank Spencer, who was the president of AATS at the time and, and also our chairman at the time at NYU, invited Dr. Carpentier to come over and give a, give a guest lecture uh, at the uh, AATS meeting and, and he titled it The French Correction. And uh, so he, he discovered, you know, mitral valve repair and discussed his findings and shared his experience. And it got Dr. Stephen Colvin, who was a junior attending at the time in the department, uh, to go over and visit Dr. Carpentier for two weeks uh, in Paris and he observed and performed the surgery, how he did it. And when he came back to NYU, he began uh, incorporating those techniques in mitral valve reconstruction. Uh, and in the 80s, the experience started. And by the uh, latter part of the decade, uh, it was slowly building a series towards uh, 150 patients. Uh, and this was published. So this was the classic technique of uh, posterior 
resection for posterior prolapse, P2 prolapse, which is the most common form of mitral valve, uh, degenerative mitral valve disease and that caused regurgitation. Then this was the standard technique by Carpentier. He would resect the part of the leaflet that was prolapsed, usually P2, reconstruct the rest of the remaining P1 and P3, which is here, P1 and P3 of the posterior leaflet of the mitral valve, reconstruct that primarily, and then stabilize the mitral annulus, which tended to dilate over time uh, with the annuloplastic ring. Now, this gave good results, but we noticed that a small percentage of patients developed left ventricular outflow obstruction after uh, mitral valve repair. And, and this phenomenon became later known as systolic anterior motion. It's defined as a paradoxical motion during systole of the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, which you know, was not repaired at the time or intervened on at the time. But as you can see here during systole, it moves towards the LVOT and causes a functional obstruction uh, during systole. So this was our experience at NYU in the uh, 80s and 90s. We noted that about 6.4% of these patients after mitral valve repair developed this phenomenon, this post-operative systolic anterior motion, and that led to clinical complications uh, from LVOT obstruction. Uh, the risk factors for these patients, they noted that they tended to have a very large sail-like anterior leaflet or a floppy anterior leaflet. They tended to have a very tall posterior leaflet. And then we, they tended to have a very uh, radical reconstruction of after resection of the posterior leaflet. So this led to a, a hypothesis at NYU. How can we reduce the risk of SAM after repair? Well, we can lower the height of the posterior leaflet. And uh, for the annuloplasty or the band, we can transition from a ring to a band so that we don't overcorrect or reduce that, that annulus. And I'll show you that in, in a video here. But so Carpentier in France realized that he was developing or experiencing the same set of problems in a small percentage of uh, his patients postoperatively, and he developed his own technique of countering that. So this was the technique that Carpentier developed to, to account for this tall posterior leaflet. In addition to resecting the prolapse segment of the mitral valve, he would take an additional segment of P1 and P2 and do a height reduction and then sew it back up. So that was his modification of his uh, repair and at NYU, uh, we developed our own method, which I will highlight here. So this is a folding plasty technique, and we do the you know resection of P2, and after that we would use sutures to plicate the leaflet here and lower the height, and then put a posterior band instead of the ring, which was our uh, hypothesis, accounting for those two factors that we could control in the operating room. And here's the video. Now you see here, this is the mitral valve, the preoperative findings, there's huge anteriorly directed uh, jet consistent with posterior prolapse. Here we see the prolapse segment of P2, you see a normal anterior leaflet, we resect the posterior segment of P2, that's prolapsed, and now we put in folding plastic sutures, which lower the height of the residual posterior leaflet. So we did that on P3, and now we're doing this on P1. Once you tie these sutures, you'll see that the height of that posterior leaflet becomes uh, reduced. So you see it's a lot of suturing, but we basically plicate the free edge of both sides down towards the midline. And once we tie that, you'll see that the, the height becomes dramatically reduced.
So that's over here. In result, we've reconstructed the whole posterior leaflet. We do our saline test after we place the, the band. These are our annual plastic stitches for, for uh, the band. So here we're just parachuting the, the band down with those stitches. And that's a functional, this is our test, the saline test. After we finish the repair, you see a competent mitral valve. So what's our data from this compared to, uh, you know, the standard mitral valve repair? Well, the freedom from reoperation or severe, moderate to severe MR at 10 years was excellent. It was 90% with the folding plasti and without. So we proved that this technique was equivalent to the traditional repair uh, in terms of durability and outcomes. Now, there's another uh, technique that came out of this experience, uh, pioneered by Dr. Toro Asai, who, who was a Japanese surgeon that did, some, that did uh, a year or two of training at NYU. When he went back to Japan, he, he hypothesized that, well, if he altered, he can reduce the height through a, a butterfly technique here. It looks like a resection that looks like a butterfly shape. Uh, and, and as opposed to the you know, original quadrangular resection by Carpentier. So you, you can imagine you, you resect the top part and the bottom part, and then you bring the bottom part towards the middle that will lower the height of the posterior leaflet. Here's interoperative uh, video or pictures demonstrating this technique. You see the resection of the, the leaflet is in the shape of a butterfly. And as you can see, you know, primarily repairs the edges back to the middle and that'll lower the height of the posterior leaflet. And here you, he chose to use a ring. So, Operative approaches for mitral valve repair started out as a sternotomy, but in the late 90s at NYU became minimally invasive. And in the late, I think late 2000s, uh, 2012, 2011, around that time transitioned to a completely robotic approach. So NYU became the first institution in the US in the 90s to perform a mini thoracotomy mitral valve repair. And this was made possible by new technology that had developed through the Hartport system device, which consisted of uh, a coronary sinus catheter through the internal jugular vein that went to the coronary sinus. You had a arterial cannula that had an endo balloon that acted as a cross clamp. So you can arrest the heart and deliver cardioplegia through this balloon device and to grade to arrest the heart. And then you had uh, a venous cannula that drained the heart. So that this was effectively your cannulas for bypass machine. You can do that through the groin percutaneously. You can stop the heart and do a repair through a mini thoracotomy incision. As we accrued experience in the 90s, by 2000, we, we had a decade worth of outcomes and data. And the outcomes were um, equivalent in terms of, uh, you know, what we were able to do, folding plasty, as you can see over time. In the 80s, was a very low percentage, but the later adoption rate became higher. Um, annuloplasty became more of a, a band instead of a ring. And anterior leaflet uh, procedures, which I'll go into in a little bit, uh, about the same. So they could replicate the traditional repair done through a sternotomy through a mini thoracotomy and the outcomes were equivalent compared to open surgery. Uh, in 2011, uh, NYU started a two surgeon team for robotic uh, mitral valve repair, and they tried to uh, replicate the same uh, outcomes through a robot approach. So here you see the incisions now. There's uh, three, three ports. The left arm goes on the left side, the right arm for the robot is down here. There's a retraction arm to expose the mitral valve. 
a camera arm in the middle and through a keyhole incision, the, the bedside uh, surgeon, Dr. Grassi, uh, would perform or assist Dr. LeMay on the robot uh, and do the repair. The techniques were replicated. You see, we did simple triangular excisions. We did sliding plasties that reduced the height of that posterior leaflet. He even uh, debrided the mitral annulus, which sometimes had calcium and repaired that and reconstructed that with a patch. Also artificial cords, which I'll illustrate later on, but that was also a technique in the armamentarium of robotic repair uh, options. And here's an example of a robotic repair. You see the visualization is improved. This is also a classic Barlow's with posterior prolapse of P2. It's a P2 excision of the um, prolapsing segment. We'll resect tethering cords and the subvalvular apparatus, perform an extensive reduction of the height of P2 and or P1 and P3, and then perform a reconstruction of the residual uh, posterior leaflet tissue. Here we're sewing back the free edges of the remnant leaflets with the robot instruments. There's more high reduction here. It wasn't happy with the height of the posterior leaflet and then reattaching the leaflet to the annulus with primary sutures uh, repair technique. And then putting in the posterior band and, and having a competent repair. So why the posterior band as opposed to the ring annuloplasty originally proposed or developed by Carpentier? Well, here you can see that there's a dynamic process uh, of the annular area of the valve with the EKG. During diastole, that, that's maximized really to allow blood to flow into the left ventricle. And here you see during systole, that area reduces uh, to maximize the blood leaving the ventricle, the left ventricle. And here, here's that illustration that shows you this concept, this anterior annulus or the aortic mitral curtain. It's a dynamic structure that moves away from the left ventricular outflow tract during systole. So it's moving away as the heart's emptying uh, out, you know, blood's emptying from the left ventricle uh, to the aorta. And that allows maximum um, hemodynamics. So that's why we do a posterior band as opposed to annuloplasty. Because if you do an annuloplasty, you're really restricting this component. You're not allowing the, the native physiology for um, the anterior mitral annulus to move away from the LVOT. So what's been the outcome uh, over the last 15 years for systolic anterior motion? Well, we were able to reduce uh, the incidence of this after mitral valve repair with the incorporation mainly of these two operative techniques from 6.4% to now 3.1%. And independent analysis, we were able to show that these two operative factors uh, reduce the, the incidence of postoperative SAM. Now, what about artificial cordae, like I talked about earlier for anterior leaflet prolapse? Well, that, that was developed in the 2000s uh, in Europe. And adoption rate has now increased uh, over the last decade. The concept is this. Uh, we move away from a resection-based approach to more of a conservative respect approach and treat the physiologic cause of the prolapse. Most, most likely, it's an elongated cord that ruptured over time. So how do we fix that? Well, we can replace that cord with an artificial cord made out of PTFE. How, we, how do we do that? We measure the length of the cord from the free edge of the leaflet to the papillary muscle in the operating room. And then we tailor that to a prefixed cord of that length. And the concept is that you put in this cord that effectively replaces the cord that broke. And here's the end result of that uh, repair. 
Now this concept uh, has really increased adoption rate, especially for anterior leaflet prolapse, so much that we no longer see this uh, very commonly. Uh, we don't really resect the anterior leaflet and, and put it back with a, a primary repair. Now we, we conserve the leaflet and uh, put in the neocords to reestablish its functional physiology. Now, so is there still a time where a sternotomy is appropriate? Well, absolutely. I think for complex bileaflet pathology with both prolapsing segments of uh, anterior and posterior leaflet, if you need to do a tricuspid repair on top of that, I think that's still the best way to do it. Now, here is an example. This patient had prior endocarditis. He was left with bileaflet prolapse. Here you see the jet. It's a very complex jet. It doesn't just go anterior, it goes everywhere. And that's consistent with both prolapse of the anterior segment here and the posterior segment. So to fix this, we utilized uh, both the resection uh, and reconstruction with artificial cordae. So there's a resection here, a slide plasty to reduce the height of this tall posterior leaflet. So the prolapsing segment has been resected here in the posterior uh, leaflet. Here's a folding plastic technique to reduce the height of that leaflet. And then look here, there's a cord here that is supporting this free edge that's not, that we um, that we have to replicate with an artificial cord to add support to this leaflet. So here are artificial cords going in. Both sides of the papillary muscle to support both sides of the repair. And now we reestablished uh, mitral valve confidence. So, um, you know, I think today's modern uh, recommendations when approaching uh, mitral valve prolapse, you can do a simple resection if the, the leaflet tissue is not excessive. But once you start having myxomatous disease and, and Barlow's, which is an extension of uh, or evolution of that myxomatous disease, uh, where you have um, taller posterior leaflet height, uh, you would start having to have to incorporate height reduction techniques, either the sliding plasty or folding plasty or the butterfly technique. Um, and once you have fire leaflet prolapse, you really should supplement the, the anterior leaflet with artificial cordae, which is really the, I think, 90, over 99% of repairs now um, for anterior leaflet prolapse. So in summary, the concept of mitral valve repair, uh, we, you know, evolved to a restorative physiology. We want to get the leaflet heights to be optimal to reduce the, the gradients and lower the risk of SAM or systolic anterior motion uh, using a posterior annual plasty that will lead to durable results. And uh, I think this, the history and story of mitral valve repair and how we got to today is really a story of innovation and, and adopting new technology and, and techniques to really improve our outcomes. And uh, I think uh, the future is very bright for this field and it's really ours. So thank you. Uh, I think at this time I'll, I'll uh, invite questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Ma. Uh, what a phenomenal um, type of procedure, especially the a robotic approach. <clears throat> um, let me ask you something, Dr. Ma. Uh, from uh, the patients that you have treated uh, together with your colleagues, what percentage of patients do qualify uh, for the uh, robotic versus the port access or their sternotomy? 
So it's it's um, center specific at NYU. I think over the last decade, um, we've developed uh, you know set criteria and, and teams from everywhere from the OR to the circulating nurse to the, the surgeons and the anesthesiologists that they're you know a decade of experience that they they I think now it's over ninety percent get the robotic uh, repair. Um, I think the exceptions are the people who've had prior surgery in the chest. Uh, although that's not 100% a contraindication, uh, or people who've had prior heart operations, uh, that, that would be more difficult and mm -hmm. done through an open sternotomy. Mm -hmm. and, and there comes a point, obviously, where the mitral repair is definitely uh, imminent and needed. Um, are there any specific types of patients that would qualify for this type of approach versus a complete uh, replacement of the valve? So um, people with degenerative mitral valve disease uh, should, the gold standard in surgery is a mitral valve repair. Uh, we've shown that durability and outcomes and survival benefit of repair uh, is, is higher uh, compared to replacement. Mm. And I, I think that, um, you know, that concept has really now been accepted. It was pioneered by Alan Carpentier in the 70s, mm -hmm. but now has pretty much been accepted throughout the surgical community in heart surgery. Um, so, you know, we're trying to build a, a mitral valve center of excellence where we can say, you know, we have enough experience to say you have over 90% chance of having a, a durable repair at this operation without needing a replacement. Mm -hmm. But that discussion is always there with the patient that, that you may need to come out with a replacement if you cannot repair the valve. And that, that's a discussion and every time, every time there's a discussion. About. I am sure. And, and you did mention, if I recall correctly, uh, that these patients that undergo this type of um, the folding plastic type procedure, uh, they up to 10 years and they're still doing great. Yeah, we, we've now seen over 20, 25 years. Oh, wow. Well, wow, that's remarkable. Durable. And uh, do we need to put these patients on specific medications, like long-term type medications, or now, I mean, they're home free? No, that, so that's the beauty of, of re, uh, repair. Uh, you don't need to put them on long-term uh, aspirin or, or Plavix. We, we do that for the first three months as the tissues healing, sure. and granulating. But uh, after that, uh, if you don't need it for another indication, no. That is quite remarkable, Doc. Um, and uh, lastly, um, if we were to bring a patient over, how long should the patient expect to be in the hospital under your care? So now it, so that depends on uh, a lot of comorbidities, whether they have a lot, but I, I've seen people, you know, leave early as two or three days after this. Uh, NYU really was aggressive uh, with early ambulation, early extubation, early delining. Uh, so patients were really ambulatory on day one. And, and normally, mm -hmm. you know, the average length of stay is about two to three days in the hospital. And I have heard from your team, obviously, that uh, we are trying to get to that level. In right, which right. the disciplinary team is assisting you and obviously your peers in mobilizing those patients as quickly as possible so they can get back to their social uh, type uh, life. Uh, that is quite remarkable, Doc. And the fact of the matter is that uh, nowadays with the advent of the new technology, especially in robotics and the technologies that you have at hand and the instruments that you have at hand in, in the Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute, uh, it is uh, absolutely incredible uh, the, um, uh, the, the lack of, comp uh, the, you know, the small amount of complications that we see. Uh, and with that, I ask, uh, do you see a lot of complications coming from these type of procedures? Uh, so the main complications uh, with mitral valve surgery, like I said, SAM, uh, you know, that phenomenon, the systolic anterior motion, we can see uh, kinking of the uh, left circumflex artery. Uh, which would cause a heart attack, really, and, and need an emergent right. bypass. And of course, bleeding, which is, is the risk is higher when you have to debride the, the mitral annulus of calcium and reconstruct that with a patch. So th those are potentially fatal complications, but I, we've been lucky to, you know, in my training, I, I would say single, single digits uh, wow. incidents. So very low overall, yeah. Wow, so very wow, safe wow. surgery nowadays. 
Uh, what is the incidence of these type of conditions and in, in what populations do we see it more? So, um, you know, mitral valve, degenerative mitral valve disease is the second most uh, valvular problem after aortic stenosis. Is that right? It's very common uh, in, in the general population. The important thing is for primary physicians, primary care physicians and general cardiologists to recognize uh, that even if the patient is asymptomatic, now we have indication to perform repair once, once mm -hmm. we discover a degenerative valvular disease and, and severe MR, because the data has shown that with earlier repair, you can normalize their, their um, life expectancy. Uh, whereas if you wait on this, eventually they'll develop heart failure. And once the ventricle dilates uh, you know, to a certain point after six centimeters or so, you know that repair is not going to be uh, you know, the boat sailed pretty much for that. And, and even if you do repair, you're going to have a decrease. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that, that is uh, quite remarkable. We are really fortunate to have you, Dr. Ma. It is uh, a, a true um, kind of accomplishment for the entire team at MCVI to actually convince you to come in and be <laughs> with us and help us with our patients. Uh, you have uh, an audience uh, that uh, uh, you have captured them at this point. And I wanna encourage everyone that uh, if you do have any questions uh, pertaining to the type of repairs that Dr. Ma and his team and the interdisciplinary team uh, does uh, to please uh, forward them directly to Baptist Health International. Uh, without Dr. Ma, I can keep you for an hour. I know that you have to go back. So I'm going to uh, just uh, help in ending by saying on behalf of our entire team at International, I would like to thank you. Uh, not only for this presentation, but also for being so approachable and being always attentive to our audience. If you have any additional questions about today's presentation, please feel free to email them to BHI webinars at baptisthealth.net. We will make certain to send them to Dr. Ma for his response and send them back to you. If you do have any patients that would benefit from this type of procedures and you would like Dr. Ma to uh, explore the possibilities, please send us a quick note at international at baptisthealth.net. We will make sure to share that information with Dr. Ma and see if we can uh, have either a teleconsultation with the patient or with you as a second medical opinion. We look forward to seeing you all in our next Cardiac and Vascular Institute lecture series, which is scheduled for May 11th, 2022. Thank you once again. Uh, please stay safe. Uh, and have a great afternoon. Thank you so much, Dr. Mayo, for your help. Thank you.